committed to preserving the vast customs of a vibrant cultural heritage. Welcome to Darshan America, folks. We come to you from Washington, D.C. My name is Ramesh Bhutani. And my name is Shilpa Alim Chandani. Of course, what's on everybody's minds is the economy and the American Jobs Act that President Obama has sent to Congress this week. Well, I came across a great article um, in Slate called Republicans versus economics. And that versus is there for a reason, because lately what you've been hearing from the Republicans is stuff that doesn't really make any economic sense. The the uh, editorial piece here breaks it down into three categories, okay? Either the fundamentalists, the cynics, or the sheep. The fundamentalists have this idea that... Uh, you know, in an economic crisis, this is what uh, Governor Rick Perry says, it's bringing us back to biblical principles. I don't really know what biblical principles oh, have to do that. with the I economic... Can tell you, that. What? you know, whenever, personally, you're in trouble, whenever, you know, the first thing you do is, oh, my God, give me strength to deal with this. So you actually say and pray to God to give you that strength. And I think that's what he's talking about. That's a starting point for him. Okay, so we elect our politicians to pray for us. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, the second piece are the cynics, right? I mean, you've got Mitch McConnell, who has said their main priority, their number one goal is making sure Obama is a one-term president. Instead of saying that our number one priority is caring for those who are suffering and jobless and who are really struggling in our country right are now. Are you saying that's Leader is, McConnell? That that's the Senate? Absolutely. Are you Senate serious? Minority. He's saying that that's his job to make sure President Obama right. is one term? So tell me, where are the solutions when that is your priority, right? Not when uh, dealing with this economic crisis in a responsible way, that should be your priority, but instead it's really all a game of politics. And, you know, then you really have the sheep who are the followers. If this is what our party leaders say, this is what we're going to do. So even if in the past... Republicans or conservatives have supported some of the measures, right, that President Obama is talking about. And even philosophically, those things are in line with the way in which other Republicans have acted in the past. If today the party leadership says, no, we're going to obstruct and we're not going to let this through, then the sheep will follow and they won't disagree. You know, uh, all media people get tangled with Republicans said this, Democrats said this, and you take the eyes off the ball. The problem is much bigger, much bigger. And yes, President Obama is a great speaker. You have to give it to him. There is no one better. But I must tell you this, that if he can just give up criticizing Republicans and actually come to the table with the Republicans, because that's in our interest. Our interest doesn't is not served by Republicans, trust me. They don't put money in my pocket, and neither do Democrats. You know, we work hard to make our money. And the problem of unemployment is so dire. Now, you see President Obama saying, well, we need to give tax cuts to people so that we can grow the economy. Well, if that's economic 101, then why not really reform the tax code? That should be job one. And that should be for both parties to do it. I was, I was reading an opinion by uh, Steve Schwarzman. You know, Steve Schwarzman, folks, he's the chairman, chief executive, and co-founder of Blackstone Group. Blackstone Group, that manages $2 trillion. And, of course, they also manage an entire department of uh, the United States of America's you know, TARP program and all of that. What he's saying is that whenever a company is in trouble, they are private equity, so they want to go and buy it. And then after they buy it, they make sure they work it in such a way so that within two or three years, it becomes profitable. So the number one item he's saying is, you need to define what the problem is. And everybody needs to agree that that's the problem. And then number two, then you design a solution for it. That's extremely important that everybody buys it, not just the CEO, but it has to be the uh, way at the bottom ladder. The third thing that's most important is 
execute. But up here, this is such a huge problem. Well, politics doesn't work that way, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but he's saying it's such a huge problem, but no one is giving it a collective push. 9-11 occurred. We lost 3,000 people. We all came together. You know, our country was under attack. Here, our country's under attack. Millions have lost their jobs. Millions of lives have been destroyed. And what are we doing? We're still playing politics, you know. We need to have a solution. Well, I think that we have the beginnings of that conversation now and a real opportunity. Many could argue, why didn't this happen sooner? We got all caught up in that debt ceiling debate and weren't focusing on what was really important. But here we are. And perhaps this is the step moving forward where we can actually look for diagnosing the problems well yeah. and then, like you said, finding the solutions and executing mm -hmm. some of those solutions. And I really think that newspapers now, with their opinion pieces, whether it's Slate or Time or Wall Street or Financial Times and the others, everybody's now really coming to picture. They used to play a party against another party because it was a spectator sport. <laughs> but now it's hurting even those editors and those reporters pocket and that's why I really think we will have the solution you know maybe politics is waiting around you know waiting around maybe 2012 13 14 but we'll find a solution yeah we will we have to right <laughs> well another story that has been on the minds of many people and in, in the post 9-11 world having just uh, marked the 10-year anniversary is uh, how has thing have things changed in terms of counterterrorism, right? How much safer are we really? And pl places like amusement parks and shopping malls all have great security systems now in place. Well, NPR did some investigation at the Mall of America in Minnesota. Now, this is quite the destination. It's a lot the of biggest mall in the <laughs> United States. A lot of tourists come to see this kind of spectacle, the Mall of America. And what's interesting about this investigation was that NPR found that of the suspicious activity reports that the mall security then uh, send over to the police, two-thirds of the people who were accused in those reports are minorities, okay? And if you look at the statistics, you know, about 70% of the U.S. population is white, 85% of the population in Minnesota is white, but two-thirds of the people who are doing suspicious activity at the Mall of America are minorities, and the vast majority of these people completely innocent. There's, you know, an example of